Joining us now, he's entering his seventh season, is that right, at Louisiana. Unbelievable. I, we've talked to him almost every year, I believe, pretty much every year, that he's been there, obviously, fresh off a 50-win season, a fourth straight Sunbelt title, a regional title, and our good friend Jerry Glasgow joining us here and in the circle. Uh, man, seven, you believe it's your seventh season already? No, it's flu. It really has. It's like time has absolutely flown by. Um, I feel like it's just the third or fourth season in that sense. On the other hand, I think that only in the last year, year and a half, has it begun to feel like my program or my team. I think the first four or five years, it was more of I was here to try to save the program for someone else. You know, wasn't I wasn't, didn't feel like I was personally a part of it. And then uh, in the last year and a half, I think because all my players are here, now all of a sudden it, it does feel like my team, my program now. Do you feel more comfortable now? Do you feel comfortable here? Because as we've talked in the past, there's a great passion for softball at that, you know, that program, high expectations. You have high expectations for yourself. You know, do you feel comfortable there accustomed to what Louisiana softball is all about? Yeah, I'm, I'm very comfortable. I've, I think I've always been comfortable here. Uh, even in the beginning, I was very comfortable because they like to win here. And that's the only place I want to coach is somewhere that wants to win. Um, and, you know, you watch, you know, uh, there's a lot of teams, you know, I feel like there's half of the Big Ten, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but I feel like the, they play softball, but they're not really trying to win. And you can tell that by the decisions the athletic directors make and so on. And then, you know, I feel like the, the SEC, I think every athletic director is trying to win. That's a perception that conference gives off. I think the Pac-12. Some try to win, some don't really care. Um, and, and so I think that's true of almost every conference except for the SEC. I think every athletic director in the SEC knows they better win at some point. And that's definitely the case here. Like our athletic director, our university president, they are very, very, very committed to winning in softball. And so that that's a good fit for me. I would I don't think I would be a, a happy or a good coach for a program that was just – going through the motions so I've been, always felt comfortable here I just didn't feel like it was you know my program so to speak well last year you won 50 games won the Sun Belt as I mentioned you win that dramatic regional in Baton Rouge uh to get to the super regional what when you've had now time to reflect on last year what comes to your mind well relief in that sense of the regional had become you know when I got here I really thought we'd win a regional within a couple of years and and I never dreamed it would become that difficult to win a regional and i think what that's a credit to the sport um there's some really good teams uh that have come in and clemson duke come to mind really quick that have put a huge emphasis on softball and then uh central florida has jumped up and and really made a push and uh i think like i said the bottom half of the sec is fully committed they're they're spending tremendous amount of money on softball throughout the whole SEC now, where you go back to 1997, you you might have had a couple of programs there in the SEC um, among those SEC schools, and even at 2000, you know it was it was it wasn't the same 20 years ago, and in 2020 and 2023 now 2024 coming up, you've got a lot of programs committed. You've got the top half of the uh, Big Ten. There's some teams in the Big Ten really committed to winning. Uh, there's teams that aren't, but there's teams that are. And so um, it's it's a credit to our sport. It's, it's winning a regional, in my mind, has uh, really um, become very difficult. And I underestimated it when I got here in 17. I thought we would win a regional real quick. I think 2020, we'll always look back here at Louisiana. I think we had a team that would have won a regional. I think we had a team that would have definitely went to the World Series with Megan Kleist and Summer Ellison. And the season ended were number one RPI, but I always go back to that because that was kind of my third year. And that was kind of a peak of our program right then, if you look at it. And then we had to start rebuilding throughout 22, 23 seasons. And now we're back to where I feel like we're, we're I feel like this season coming up, we're going to be very, very similar to the 2020 program, a team. Looking back at last year, because I'll never forget, you win the Sun Belt, you win at home against a good Marshall team, you get to selection Sunday. All the metrics that you had, resume, schedule strength, RPI rankings, all 
look like, hey, you should host. I thought you should host. I had you hosting. You did not. It was a surprise to met some. Uh, you get sent to Baton Rouge. But I remember talking to you. You all took it as a positive because, hey, we're going to use this as fuel, motivation, your players. And you could sense that on how you played there and winning that regional. Just take me through that process of you're there, you're thinking you might host, but you don't host, but you didn't allow your players to let that affect them. Because a lot of programs in the past, I've seen it where they're expected to host and they don't, and it affects how they play the following weekend on the road. But that didn't happen to your team. How? Yeah, I, you know, I had – you texted me. I had a lot of people text me and say, you're going to host. And I think there was a way you could look at it where it looked like we would host. We deserved to host. But there was also a way that it didn't look like we had host. And that was simply based on one one metric, what your record was against the top 25. And we did not – we did, we played a lot of top 10 teams. So our top 25 metric might have been skewed a little bit, but I never, ever – I really never thought we were going to host the last three or four weeks. And then, you know, when people like you texted me saying, hey, you're definitely hosting. I had a lot of people texting me that knew, that knew the sport for years. But I had I had also been told by, you know, it had been out of the committee was really emphasizing top 25 wins and top 25 win percentage. And that that metric that I knew we were short in, um, never, I think knowing that just didn't, I never bought in that we were going to host. So I really wasn't surprised. And I thought about all the scenarios. If we don't host, where do we want to go? And that was simple. I, that, that was a great draw for us to go back over to LSU again last year. And, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of the local Cajun fans don't like that trip, but I love that trip. I, we get so many fans there that will almost equal our, our, our Cajun fans may there are some games I think we probably have outnumbered them but we'll definitely be very near 50 50 either way uh when we play there and then our kids have played there enough now we're we're very comfortable uh and then I thought last year our team matched up really well with uh LSU I thought they were a very good team and they're, of course they're always well coached but I thought we matched up well on paper right particular at that particular time with them yeah, it came down to a dramatic game six and seven, though. You two always have dramatic games, and I feel for both of you uh, because on the one hand, it's great theater. It's great softball, great passion. You mentioned it's you know it's a bus trip. It basically, it's an easy travel. On the other hand, I kind of feel like you're both World Series caliber teams, at least super regionals, and they're making you play in the regionals based on geography, which I feel like is unfair to both of you, in fairness. Now, it is what it is. Uh, did you get an explanation in the offseason why you didn't host? Because I did think you should have hosted. Uh, you did everything you could on your power. They could say that you, quote, didn't have enough top 25 wins, but some of that is beyond your out of your control. Uh, other leagues have advantages on that. You did your part from scheduling. You did have enough quality wins, in my opinion. Did you get an explanation during the offseason? Yeah, that's what I was told after it was all over. It's just the top 25 wins. And I think you look back, there was a, a two to one loss to Baylor and a three two loss to Texas AM. I think those two tipped the scales because we that was two late season losses. We played good, but we didn't play quite good enough to win. And we were on the road. That's the other part that, you know, they don't take into a, a factor home and away. And all of our games last year, almost all of those were on the road. Yes. Um, and then early in the season, we had the stretch in Florida where we were playing without Maya Davis, who was injured, our leadoff hitter, All-American, a key, key component of our offense, the most important component of our offense as you look at the second half of the year. And then alongside of her, we we hadn't yet discovered Lauren Allred, so who you know hit 375, led our team in home runs, led our team in RBIs as a freshman. So we got a lot better at the end. But those those things – come into a factor with a committee i think if they get looking that close at you know at 64 teams or even more than that actually 90 probably 90 teams in consideration tournament you just we just we had the opportunity our schedule allowed it we just didn't get the job done i never had hard feelings about it or even i was never upset about it and i think that leads to your team playing well when you get where you're where you ultimately got to go which isn't up to you you don't control it so I'm I'm looking forward to this year. And I do think that one thing that's positive going into 24 is, you know, Baton Rouge and LSU, they know, they pretty well know and we know we won't go there this year. They're not going to send us to the same place two years in a row. They I guess they could possibly. Let's hope not. <laughs> here, but, yeah, I don't 
that's not likely to happen. I just don't see the committee. They want the student athletes to have different experiences. So we either want to be at home this year or we're going to go to a different place, a new place. Um, so that's all stuff you don't, it's too early to worry about in well, my mind. And I, well, and I will say there's no reason why you both of you couldn't host, right? Like, I mean, I, a couple of years ago in Florida, we had three host sites. So there's yeah. no reason why you two couldn't host. So anyway, we'll leave that alone. That's my own pet peeve uh, on that stuff. What take me through that moment when you get the final out and you realize you've won a regional because you've kind of you've teased yourself in a little bit. You kind of joked about, you know, not being able to get out of that regional. What did it, uh, of a regional? What did it mean to finally get that over the hump as a head coach and get to that super regional? Uh, it's a huge relief because, you know, I've made that stupid comment a few years ago, you know, without a doubt, not arguably without a doubt. The dumbest thing I've ever said is since I've been a head coach, you know, I don't want to be called regional Glasgow. And, uh, uh, yeah, so that was a really stupid thing to say. Um, but, and we lost game three to Ole Miss, uh, very easily could have won that game. Their, Rachel Becker made a great catch, jumped over the wall. We had two horrific calls on the base before they had appeals. They didn't have appeal yet. And, you know, we lost that game 4-3 or 5-4. We we very easily could have won that regional. Then we lost game three to LSU. It was, I think, one for one score going into the sixth, uh, seventh inning. We were right there in game three of that game in the 2019 regional, 2021 regional, 2018 regional. Yeah, it was 2018, my first year. We had some chances. You know, we just – uh, there's only been one reason we didn't make it to game three. And last year was when we finally got that win, it's like, whew, that's a, a load off my shoulder because I first I don't have to hear a regional Glasgow anymore. And hopefully I won't say something that stupid again for a while. But uh, uh, it was a great feeling and happy for the girls. Um, and then, to you know, just to get it go on and experience that for your program. And I think get get the super regional experience that will help us this year when we get back to Super Regional and try to make it punch our way into World Series. What do you want the returners to, to to take from that experience of winning that regional, getting a taste of that, and getting a taste of what it's like in the Super Regional because you ran into a buzzsaw in Washington that was had all that momentum from their regional win. What do you what what did you learn from that experience you want your players that return take to, into this year? I want them to remember how bad it hurts to lose, you know, and to be that close you're two games you're winning two games away from the world series and you know just how bad it hurts to lose that game and and then how close you know we in game two we out hit washington i think 10 to 5 if i remember right and that's strictly by, going by memory from three months ago so it may be wrong but I, in my mind we out hit them but we didn't score we didn't get the big hit um and you know to that the bottom line remember how bad it hurts but also remember you know, we should have worked a little harder. We need to work a little harder. And right now, like this fall, this is a time to work, not in April next year. Right now, when you you try to make yourself two games better by by really giving everything you got in the fall practice session. Let's talk about this tiers team. Obviously, uh, let's start in the circle. Sam Landry, 19-game winner, uh, leading the way. You added Alexi Delbray from transfer from Florida. Just talk about your pitching staff. Yeah, we got a really good pitching staff this year. I mean, the one thing that's really stood out to me in the fall, uh, we lost a lot with Kendra Lamb and Megan Shorman and Carly Heath. Those three pitchers were were really good. And we lost a lot there. But the one thing that stood out is, man, we're good. We got five solid pitchers. Um, I'm thrilled with all of the newcomers. I'm thrilled Sam Landry has improved uh, over last year. I can see improvement in her. She's throwing really hard. She already had some nights where she's above 70. Um, you've got Chloe Riosetto, who's a left-handed sophomore. She just threw a two-hitter against a, a, a really good lineup in the inner squad a couple of days ago and gives us that left-hand presence. Her velocity also is up and throwing really hard, really well, um, improved her changeup. So we got the two returning pitchers that are really elite. And then we picked up uh, three pitchers that are just really complementary to both Sam and Chloe. And then in their own way, they're each unique. And um, I'm just thrilled. Sam Ryan took Chattanooga State to a junior college and then pitched for uh, Canadian national team last summer. She's throwing the ball. She's throwing as hard as 68 this, this fall, and I, I look forward to get even harder as we go into spring. She's really uh, athletic on the mound fielding. Uh, 
as are all the all five pitchers are good fielders this year. Um, so Sam Ryan, very competitive, hard worker. And then Denali um, Lecker come over from Iowa, and she adds in the drop ball. And she's increased her velocity by quite a bit. She's throwing a lot harder now. She's had some outings where she was absolutely stunning and how effective she was. Um, really had some – she's going to make an impact on our ball club because she gets the easy ground balls, and she um, she just really – has that maturity on the mound. She's very calm. You don't see emotion out of her. And and most of all, we just needed that down ball pitcher. And then uh, Lexi Delbury came in from Florida as the most heralded pitcher of the three because of what she did her freshman year when she took Florida to the uh, World Series. And she's really uh, been a blessing to us. She's got her health back. She's very healthy right now. She's extremely competitive, very fiery on the mound, and she's very polished on the mound in her experience. She she knows how to get batters to pop up. She knows how to get batters to ground out. She can get to strike out when she needs it. A very mature uh, pitcher going into her junior year, as is Sam Ryan. Lecker uh, is a uh, senior, and then Sam Landry is a junior this year, which, you know, the crazy she's already a junior and of course Rio Seto is a sophomore so we've got four pitchers that'll be back next year and then the Lecker with her drop ball we believe is going to be a real uh important tool as we go through the season so I feel like our pitching staff is even more balanced than than last year um I you know it'll whether we're we're as good or a little bit better or a little bit worse that'll be played out during the season because we a lot of respect to Kendra Lamb and, and Carly Heath and Megan Shorman. But it won't surprise me if we're as good. It won't surprise me if we're a little better. It also wouldn't disappoint me a lot if, we're, if we end up being a, a hair short of last year. But I think our pitching staff is very, very good. You mentioned Denali. I was a big fan of hers at Iowa. She was a two-way player there. They used her more as a closer, but she was a bit middle of their bat line. A couple questions on her. Will you still use her? offensively is she going to be a two-way player for you and then number two do you envision her as a starter or more as a reliever is that still to be figured out yeah i definitely will use her on offense she's she's second on our team in rbis this fall she showed the ability to hit the home run it's the same as she did at iowa i mean it's no fluke that's a pretty you know that's a pretty formidable it's a it's a power five conference and uh you know i was kind of that overlooked team over there because you know, whatever, they don't finish at the very top. But, she, you know, she, 10 home runs, 47 RBIs is no accident when you're playing in Power 5 Conference. And she showed that ability. She's she's actually hit really well with runners in scoring position this fall. And uh, added, I, I believe she's adding, it, uh, adding to her understanding of hitting. I think she's going to be a better hitter in the spring than she's ever been in her life. Um, she's going through the hitting – contest system that we do here and she's going through them all the things that we do and we hopefully we're going to see a few less strikeouts and and maybe a little bit more consistency at the plate and then I think the biggest thing for her is just getting in that lineup does she get in the lineup every day or is she platooned that's the stuff we don't know yet we know we're going to be deep offensively and we know she's going to be a part of it how much of it you know, we'll, we'll let the season dictate in the spring uh, competition before in the preseason. As far as the pitching staff, still, we don't know. You know, like I watched her pitch a couple weeks ago, and she absolutely dominated the team. And I, I could very easily see that that Denali being a starter for us. And, and then there's been other times when someone else pitches extremely well, and they oh, can't start everybody. So I don't – I just know that Denali Lecker is going to be an extremely important piece of a, of a really strong bullpen for us. And any scenario, I can envision our, our bullpen and our pitch staff maxing out and reaching their true potential. It has to involve a lot of Denali Lecker. So she's going to be a key component. How exactly it fits in will it play out as the season goes. With a hitter, a hitter like Denali, who's had success at a high level, and they come to your program, how much do you tinker with them as far as their mechanics? How much do you kind of apply, you keep what, what's been working for them, right? There's that fine balance of what's been working for them. But at the same time, you're like, you know, if we could tinker a couple things, we can even make you better. How do you balance that out as a hitting, as a coach? Yeah, very carefully because it's a, it's a really good point. And I think the, the other key component of that is uh, Denali is an extremely hard worker. And so that can also go against a hitter 
because when you're an extremely hard worker, your muscle memory becomes very hard to change. It's very locked in because the amount of repetitions hard hitting, hard working hitters take. They take millions of swings, I imagine, in their career. And so with her being, you know, the the last year senior um, that she is, I, I've, I've been very careful. And I, if she asks me something, we try to address it. We're trying to add some things to improve her understanding of her swing mechanics and of the swing sequence. But as far as actually like breaking her swing, starting down, uh, changing some of the things that she does, she's she's a little bit, uh, she's a hitter that bars her front arm a little bit. I'm not going to change that. If she was a, a 18 year old freshman, I would probably try to get that elbow bend a little bit and pay a little bit more attention to the arm bar, but she's very successful with it. And you can, you can find an occasional major league hitter that that's very successful with it. So it's not something that an absolute that we have to change. Um, we're just trying to mainly, I think, build her knowledge and her understanding of what the swing should look like, what we want it to look like, and then absolutely get her to understand the sequence of her swing, uh, which should be the exact same for every single hitter on our team or any other team. Um, and I think she's, she's a very intelligent player. So I think she's doing a really good job of controlling um, what we want her to do and what she's doing in her in her efforts in practice. And I, I, I see no reason she won't be a key part of our, our batting you offense. Your, you mentioned your offense going to be deep. You did lose some pieces from that offense, but you do return a good nucleus of it. So just talk about what you see in your offense so far. Yeah, I think it's going to be the, the, the best offense that we've had here. Now our schedule is brutal. Um, so at the end of the season, you look at the numbers, may not, it may not show, you know, statistically on paper, it may not turn out to be the best offense because the schedule is going to be so tough. But in my mind, like this team can do a lot of different things. They got speed to steal bases. We, we can play the short game, the bunny game. We could slap, uh, we can hit a home run. We can hit a lot of home runs. Um, we're really balanced and we, we don't have. We don't have any players that would you would consider slow. We're 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 a very fast physical team, um, so I think it's going to be the best offense that we've had. They're also experienced. You know, you look at the last couple of years. We've had a lot of freshmen two years ago, a lot of freshmen and sophomores last year. But uh, you know, our, our our leading hitters the last two years were freshmen, both years. Uh, Lex Langliers, uh, Stormy Kopsinik were freshmen at two years ago and then last year our, our two leading hitters uh along with Carly Heath was uh Lauren Allred and Maya Davis both freshmen so now those kids got experience and um I I, I feel really good and then we've added in experienced players to go with them Sam Rowe who's got two years experience at Florida um and then um Denali we've talked about and then the one we haven't talked about is Brooke Ellistad, who's absolutely phenomenal at shortstop defensively and at hit 404 and or 424, I believe. And I think her average is 404 for two years. Her career average is 404 at St. Thomas University. And she, she's, you know, really exciting to watch. And, uh, you know, playing the schedule we're going to play is going to be a, a jump up for her. Um, but she's got the physical tools and the confidence to play a, a a really good schedule and still be uh, an above average offensive player, if not a top level offensive player. And that's what we're going to find out defensively. Uh, she is an amazing shortstop. I, I, she's going to be uh, in for a lot of postseason awards based on her defense, along with the offense that I've seen. So I'm super excited about Brooke at shortstop. Who's your leader on the offensive side, either with their production, but also leadership as far as leading by example, or even vocal leader. Yeah, without a doubt, Lauren Allred and Maya Davis have, have just, they're really good. Um, they were really good last year. I think Davis hit, what, 380 and, and Lauren Allred 375 maybe. Yep, 375. And, and, you know, Allred had 13 home runs and didn't play, but I think she only started 46 games because I didn't didn't get her in that lineup till uh, you know, almost a third of the way through the season. But those two kids are extremely talented. And then, you know, around them, you've got so many good players. Jordan Campbell hit 392 a couple of years ago, uh, a very proven veteran player now. Um, 
uh, Alexa Langlier's hit 375 with 13 home runs in the 2021 season. And then last year came back again with double digit home runs and a very, very good offensive player and a very good defensive player. So you got all those kids along with uh, Sophie Piscos, who's hit three, 330 or 340 in her career. You've got uh, uh, Lainey Crater, who hit 364, I think, as a freshman. And then you got Maddie Hayden, who's probably been one of our top three hitters all fall. And hit over 400 her whole freshman year, ended the year with a little bit of a slump at the end. It dropped her down like 368. But just an absolutely phenomenal player on both sides, defensively and offensively. So we're deep. We're, we got a lot of veteran, a lot of veteran experience that I think is going to put together. We'll be able to put 11, 12 different players in that lineup at any given time that are that should be plus 300 hitters at, when they're hot. I think Lauren's in a great example who, when her number was called, when she got her opportunity, she took advantage of it and never left the lineup again. And I don't know if enough players know that, right? Like we always focus on who's starting opening day and who's not starting all that. But I think it's a great message to players that maybe don't start right away that, hey, just because you're not starting right away doesn't mean that your opportunity may not might come for whatever reason, whether it be an injury, like what happened with your team, whatever. I think she's a heck of a story. Just tell a little bit more about that story. I, I don't I think it's an underrated story. Yeah. You know, as coaches, like we believe players come in and get better. Like we, we believe players have to come in and get better. And I think that, the you know, the. You've never had a better time in the in the history of softball than right now with all the recruiting services and the you know extra inning softball and all, softball. America. There's so much great publicity for our young kids out there, which is all great. But it, it also has created a little bit of a misleading aura. You know, kids are top five recruit, and they don't, they they've got to come in and they've got to improve. It doesn't matter what they are, top five, top one hundred, top twenty. Well, Lauren already come in here you know, not ranked, an unranked recruit, but her physical bill was very good. And then she's increased her, like her running speeds went from 3-1 to 2-7-8. She's really worked hard in the weight room. She's a lot, she's extremely, she's increased her athleticism, just her pure athleticism immensely. She's gotten stronger in the weight room, but she came in and went to work. And in the fall of 2022, she had uh, two, uh, she had 152 in the fall and 194 in January, February in preseason. Because I went after she started, when I put her in, I think it was five for her first 11 with two or three home runs. And I, I was literally driving to my office on a Monday morning after that and thinking, how did I miss that kid? What was I looking at? Because I do, I keep stats on everything. And uh, I, w I come right into my office when I parked my car. I come in, I pulled out her fall stats and her January, February stats. And that's the reason I know those numbers, you know, and she you know, hit 152. I didn't miss anything. She hit 194. I didn't miss anything. Well, what she did that wasn't unmissed, it wasn't unnoticed because that's why I was putting her in games. I even put her against UCLA. I put her in against Florida State. I had noticed her in batting practice really had improved. And what she did that you want all kids to do is she just went to work. She didn't judge herself. She didn't beat herself up. She just strictly went to work. And and with a fever pitch, she went to work with a fever pitch. Like she's a she's extremely dedicated to being better and still is today, which is why, you know, she's going to go ahead and continue to improve. Uh, she's also extremely intelligent. You know, she had an extremely high ACT score. Like the kids ACT score indicates if she wants to be a doctor, she can be a doctor. She's that kind of intelligence. And then you put that hard work effort with it. It's really, um, really a, a blessing to have a kid like that in the program. And so we use her now like an example, like the lineups, not, no matter what happens this fall, my lineup won't be set because I think somebody might go home over Christmas break and come back in a whole nother level of player, which is what Lauren did. She, you know, the fall set her back. It, it'll take your breath away when you see kids in hitting contests. There are 16 hitters this year. And somebody's finishing 16th. And if you're 15th and 16th every week in 11, 12, 13 straight contests, that kind of takes your breath away. But you got a chance to go home at Christmas, reevaluate everything, and then come back at a different level after Christmas. And that's what Lauren already did. Um, and we're hoping that somebody will do that again this year. 
you mentioned Sam Rowe. How do you envision using her from a defensive standpoint? Because uh, that's the thing. You have so much depth. So, And I know that's one of the things you always work on and try to figure out is defensively, what gives you the best defense? Because there, you don't want to sacrifice too much defense for the offense. There's that balancing act. So how do you envision uh, using a Sam Rowe, even a, a Denali when she's not pitching? Do you envision using her in a position? Where? How do you envision those players? Yeah, that's where I can see a, a different this year. Our, our roster is deep. And in the past, I always say nine best hitters play. The nine best hitters play, with the exception of maybe shortstop, maybe second base. But invariably, those positions end up being one of your best hitters, it seems like, in, in my experience. And and that's what that'll be the case this year because both our catchers, uh, we got three people catching. Uh, both returning catchers, uh, Sophie Piscos and Vic Valdez, are are capable hitters. I think Vic's batting over 500 this fall. Sophie Piscos is a career 350 hitter and and hitting around 350 to 400 again this fall. Uh, Valdez is a sophomore, hit 248 last year. was a was a very capable freshman bat, but has made great improvement in the fall, hitting over 500. I think she was actually leading our team in in inner squads and everything so far this fall. Um, so you got those two, and then you got Sam Rowe, who, you know, number three recruit in the country out of out of high school to the SEC school of Florida, number one ranked recruit as a freshman, number one ranked recruit as a sophomore, very capable behind the plate, but also very capable in the infield. And we played her at second. She's outstanding. Uh, when she's played second base for us, it's been just really fun to watch. Like I had no idea how good she was defensively at second, and then we put her at third, and she's very good over there. So – and the, the beauty of Sam Rose, she wants to win. So, like, wherever we need her to put her to make our lineup the best, she's willing to do that. And we've got more depth on offense than we do on defense, I feel like. So that's what's going to allow us this year. Like, this year I could very easily see us actually playing our best defense, knowing that we can have offense. Like, we've, we, we, we're, we're going to have – to put an emphasis on defense to make the jump that we want to make and get to the World Series because those postseason games invariably come down to the key component of defense. And then I, I think no matter how we do our defense, we're going to offensively be capable of scoring three, four, five runs in a game. And, and we can platoon kids in and out. And what I've been telling the kids since day one of fall is I'm not looking for nine kids. I'm Why would I look for nine? I'm looking for 13 or 14 kids. So – it's up to them to get themselves good enough defensively, offensively, like compete with each other in a very positive way. And then get yourself where you could be in that rotation of 13 or 14 players that coach wants to have and needs to have. Um, and then we'll figure it out from there. Let's talk about the Sun Belt. It was a two bid league. Texas State joined you in the tournament. Uh, South Alabama was one of the first four out. How do you feel about the growth of the league in the Sun Belt? Considering the transition that it's gone through with new members like JMU now joining the league, you got to experience that last year. Marshall joined the league. How do you feel about the league here going into year two of the league, kind of the way it is right now? I, I don't even, you know, I, I I think if we do our job and we're competing at the level we want to compete at, the Sun Belt will take care of itself. So I don't really even think about the Sun Belt. Uh, I, I will we're, we're competing with a postseason and and the bids, you know, trying to get that bid. The the, the Sun Belt is what it is. It's it's a really good mid major conference, and there'll be, you know, I think Texas State will pop back up this year. That's a team that I look at, and I I think you know they're well coached. They've got a senior pitcher. Um, they've got a very good offensive pitcher. They picked up a couple of good transfers. I think they're very good. And then, you know, you got South Alabama. They've got two senior pitchers. they got Becky Clark's been there for a long time and, and an absolutely outstanding coach. Um, so those are the teams that I would jump up and, and off the top of my head. Um, Troy, you, it's kind of a wild card this year. They lost a lot, but they've got a new coach there, and they played very well last year, made a rebound season in his first year. So I think they'll be good. Marshall? They're going to have a new coach, and they lost a lot of players to the transfer uh, window or portal. So I don't, I really don't know what to expect out of Marshall. And then James Madison is James Madison. They, they, they're always going to have great recruits coming in there because of the history of their program. And uh, and Coach Lawrence is Lawrence a really good coach and a really 
a really good addition to our conference because she's so uh, she's really fun to work with as a co-coach in the league. So those are teams right off the bat that you know we know are are good, and then it's going to be interesting, you know, what what uh, Georgia Southern, Georgia State, how how they grow this year, along with App State and um, ULM. So those are kind of the the that the ultimately if the league grows and improves, going to be on that. Uh, bottom that bottom third if they make a big jump then we're going to be really pushing to be the fifth best conference in the country at the very top of the conference we're we're pretty good and uh we can compare i thought the top if you compare our top three to the big Ten's top three we're right there with them and you compare us to any conference we're we're at least comparable uh at the very top i think well, one thing that many could compare to you is your schedule, your non-conference schedule. Holy mackerel. Let me read some of this. And I'm not doing it justice because I could read the whole schedule. And we could spend hours on it. But you're going to open at home. You're hosting Cal, New Mexico, and Chattanooga. You're playing Mississippi State midweek in Starkville. You are hosting Baylor in a three-game weekend series. A little different. You've played them in midweeks. Now you're playing them on the weekends. You're playing in, in Austin in a tournament with Texas and Stanford, hello, <laughs> and Colorado State. You're playing in Norman, oh, by the way, with Oklahoma, Liberty, and Miami of Ohio, three in, uh, Miami, Ohio, NCAA tournament team, regional final, Liberty, regional final. I think we know who Oklahoma's resume very well. Uh, you're playing at Central Arkansas, who obviously was a regional team last year. You still play LSU in a midweeks. You still have McNeese. Uh, so clearly... Uh, you're not you're not stepping back from your scheduling philosophy. Holy, just wow! That's all I gotta say, Coach. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, like who's the dummy did that, right? Like why, <laughs> why you do that? <laughs> uh, I ate too many Wheaties that morning, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, I want to play a good schedule. The one thing I've learned is uh, being at the mid major is you still there's a reason why the SEC and and the Pac-12 compete so well in the postseason. It's because they play a great schedule that gets them ready to play a great schedule. And, you know, you look at what Patty Gasso at Oklahoma last year, she played a brutal schedule. I thought I played a brutal schedule, but she played an even more brutal schedule. She didn't have to do that. She didn't play that schedule to get an RPI. I mean, Oklahoma was going to get the RPI they needed. She played that schedule to prepare for the postseason. So when I really look at what other co coaches are doing and what, what the top programs are doing, the one thing I think that's essential for postseason success is to have a competitive um, a competitive schedule in the regular season. And so knowing that we're in the Sun Belt, you know, I expect if we can compete with that schedule, I've got out of conference and we've got to prove that. But if we can compete with it and, and hold our own there, then we should be fine. We don't have to worry about the Sun Belt Conference. We, you know, we will pick up some losses. We know that. Uh, we, we've only went through the Sun Belt one time undefeated. And and very fortunate to do that, but you know that's not going to happen very often. We know we're going to incur a loss or two, or maybe even three or four. But the one thing I do know is that our schedule will allow us to be really top heavy out of conference in our non conference schedule. And then, unlike last year, I didn't feel like we got any credit for that from the committee. I think at some point the committee is going to reward you. You keep doing that over and over and over and over. And uh, I also always want my kids to know like. Not only do they have a chance to host a regional, I want to know they had a chance to host a super regional. And if we don't do it, then, you know, we just didn't do it. That's fine. There's only eight teams going to host. So 294 are going to not are going to come up short and eight are going to get that job done. But we had a chance to do it. And if we can sneak a game off Oklahoma, if we can sneak a win off Texas, if we can, you know, win the series with Baylor, if we can go to Mississippi State and play well and get a win over there. If we just keep, you know, LSU, we got a chance. So if we can steal a few wins along the way, not only do we have a chance to hold to host that regional, we could hold we could host a super regional at that point. And everybody will know we deserve to host a super regional if we do it the right way with our schedule. So that's what I tried to do. I tried to schedule very competitively. Also looking for the teams at different levels. You know, I think Cal could very easily slip back up into that top twenty five this year. Uh, Mississippi State. You know they're going to be a top 50 RPI team, but if they have a great year, could they be a top 25? Very easy to see them in the top 25 if they have a good SEC season. And then Baylor last year, 
I think was 21 or 22 ACT, and they've got a couple of players that were injured. But I, th- I expect them to be a top 20 RPI team this year. So I tried to get, you know, the Oklahoma, we know where they're going to be RPI-wise. They're, they're not going to be number 11. They're going to be up there at the very top. Stanford, I believe, was three last year. And, you know, they've got uh, Kennedy coming back who's – uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry, there's a very good, good, there's a good chance you could be having the number one and number two ranked teams when the preseason polls comes out. You could probably say you'll have the number one and number two ranked teams in the country in your schedule. Yeah, we hope so. You know, that's what we're hoping. We want, we want that because then we can get a good measure of what we are. Yeah. And then our fans, our fans want to win. You know, they they want to play all them teams here at home, and I can't get them all to Lafayette. Uh, you got to got to go on the road to be able to get them to come to Lafayette later on, but. I mean, it's just so it's just who our program needs to be and it's a reputation we want to have, I think, is we're not over here hiding or trying to manipulate or we're just going to go out and play everybody and then whatever happens, happens. We're going to just throw down and if we win some and we lose some, we'll be in a good spot. But it sounds like to me, and I think it's underrated, uh, you sound like very much what I've talked to Coach Ball Maloney at UCF and her scheduling philosophy. Part of it is what you have, right? Like you have an experienced group that could probably handle this, where maybe a, maybe you don't schedule as aggressive with a young group as inexperienced, but you have an experienced group that's talented. And her philosophy is when you have that, give them that opportunity to earn either hosting regionals, hosting a super region. Like you mentioned, you can't do that by ducking people, right? You got to schedule and, and earn it on the field. And I feel like you have a similar philosophy. You want to give your players every opportunity to get to accomplish their goals. Is that am I am I accurate in your part of the in part of the strategy there? No, it's dead on. I mean you want you want to you want to give the kids the opportunity to play and then it also motivates them to fall like, hey, let's work hard. You know, like it's coming. Uh, Oklahoma's waiting on us. Texas is waiting on us. Stanford's waiting on us. They know where they're playing us. They're not over there loafing. They're they're working and they're you know Oklahoma's not worried about Louisiana. They're worried about winning the World Series. Stanford's not worried about anything except winning the World Series this year. Texas worried about winning the World Series. That that's what they're all they're all working to win the World Series, and we can use those teams and knowing they're in our path, and to motivate ourselves in this fall season to really get ready, and um, it's going to be an exciting season because of that. LSU, as I mentioned, now this year it's a midweek home and home as versus a weekend tournament setting that you've done the previous few years. Is this going to be the new model for the matchups between the two of you? Uh, is this kind of a year by year? We'll see every year might be different how, as far as the LSU series. No, I think it's just the way it worked out this year. I, th- I think that to get the games that I needed to get in and then for Coach Beth to get the things that Beth needed to get in, uh, she's phenomenal to work with. She's a, a super nice, just a super nice person. And then for her to, to do the home and away schedule with us in any form or fashion is really – Oh, it's just a, a really refreshing um, situation. And one of the coaches that I admire most in college softball because she's such a great person uh, off the field. And then, of course, the program speaks for itself. LSU's always going to be a top 15 team every year and then on a regular basis, top 10. And, um, you know, it's just a way that to get everything we need and everything they need in their schedule, it didn't work out for us to host that um, weekend home and away. The other part is it's tricky to get two teams that want to come in and play LSU and Louisiana three or four times in a given weekend. That we you know we may be Louisiana scared some people a little bit more, but it was just getting the right teams to come and play. And we it, RPI is so important to us. And then of course Coach Beth wants she's like that. She plays a really tough schedule every year. She plays a, a really hard out of season schedule. She didn't have to play, but she understands the importance of it. And so we neither one could afford to just have a weekend where we played and give up, you know, the whole weekend playing teams that didn't help us RPI wise or for her experience wise. So that's just a one year decision. And we'll go back and and do whatever, you know, is best in the future. That's great. I love it. I love how you both work together on that, because that's big for the state of Louisiana, that matchup. It's fun. It's It's as I mentioned, it's a huge softball state and it's a fun game to play uh every year so i i think i applaud both of you for making that happen yeah it's a great state and you know both programs have great fans great fan bases yeah. and then uh the, you know they're all cajuns whether lsu cajun or a ul cajun right. 
uh, the fan bases are a lot of fun. Or you know, you go to LSU, they're cooking out, and they're doing the same things that they do here. The tailgating outside the stadiums are are fantastic, and then they've got a very loyal following over there that follow their softball program just as we do here. So it's it's a neat, uh, it's it's good. And then when you get down, like Coach Beth was the first one who said this, not Jerry Glasgow. Coach Beth said this will be really good for the twelve and under and the fourteen and under and the junior high teams and the youth travel. Uh, softball, the youth softball players, whether that be school ball or travel ball, and she was thinking of that when we started up this series, and she's dead on. It's just really good for the young ladies that are involved in our sport at the you know ten and under and twelve and under and eight and under levels. Lastly, uh, I want to ask you about a certain coach by the name of Tara Archibald, <laughs> uh, who made the yeah. NCAA tournament last year. And I wanted what are your thoughts on that. Obviously, we I talked to her at length. She's talked about it's been public. You've talked about it. How, you know, her being involved in softball. You're, you know, you you got into softball because of your your kids in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, the path on that. What was it yeah. like for you know? What was it like for you this last year, Selection Sunday? It's one thing you're worried about. Obviously, you're wondering about where you're going to where your team's going. Are you going to host and all that? But here's your daughter going to the NCAA tournament as a head coach for the first time. There's a pride there. Take me through. Were you able to enjoy that as a father? Were you able to enjoy that? Oh, absolutely. Like, you know, you ask me to brag on my kids. That's really easy because so proud of both my daughters and, and, and all three of my daughters before we lost Terry Ann, but um, just extremely proud of Tara and what she's accomplished. And, you know, we were setting into a conference tournament, um, I was able to sit in my office with my dad and my wife and, um, you know, we're all here. We're all watching. Uh, we've got to go out and play the championship game. It starts at 12 o'clock and we're playing Marshall and we're in my office and we've got her on Apple TV. We're watching uh, Eastern Illinois against, uh, was it SEMO? I believe. Uh, I can't remember who they were playing, but literally they had three outs to go and it's like 1155. <laughs> and you know, the national anthem is going to, start or maybe it was like 11:53, but i knew like i need to be on the field at 11:57 because the national anthem and uh they got the first out they got the second out and then i, I said i'm not leaving i'm i'm filming my dad watching the third out and i'm watching the tv and they get the third out and i run to the field and i go through the gate and the national anthem's like on the third note and i i run right up as the national anthem started i was going through the gate on the softball field and i thought huh, it's meant to be we're going to win today we're going to win too because um, but just the way that timing was, I just felt like that was like divine intervention there. You know, this yes. wasn't just an accident to me as a, a, in in my head and my belief. Like I was to get a watch that was huge. And then, uh, you know, we got lucky and won the game against Marshall, won nothing. They played just a great game and, and again, could have went either way, but we won one to nothing. And uh, that was, that was a really big moment to realize that, you know, Eastern Illinois had never been to an NCAA tournament. And when Tara took that job, I thought it was a great job for her. You know, we talk about, you know, she was at Illinois State and working for Melinda Fisher, a great coach, uh, Hall of Fame coach. And is this the right place? Is this the place to start? And I'm like, it's the place to start because it's, number one, it's, it's in our home area up there. We knew that area recruiting-wise. It's where the Southern Force started. It's where I started. It's where she played high school and then college ball. And so we knew the, I thought the recruiting would work out, but then you look at it, you know, the stadium and there's not a lot to recruit from in the Ohio Valley. I mean, you're, you've got a, a lot of obstacles to overcome, which there should be. And there is for any of these. I mean, you, you think, well, Louisiana is a tough coaching job. No, those, you know, like I admire the coaches in the Mac and the Ohio Valley and, and th those conference, those coaches, these small schools, they have a really limited budget. And they just, there's so many things they have to overcome the field, the grounds crew, there's things that they don't get that they have to provide and figure out a way to come up with. And all those obstacles were there at East Illinois. And, and to me, I, I remember telling them, say, if you can win there with the obstacles you have, you can win anywhere. And you need to do that so that you can prove it not only to the future ADs that may hire you, but to yourself as a coach, you want to know you can coach. And I, I believe she could coach. I knew she could coach because of past experience, but it was just a great, and then in spite of all that, and your knowledge of softball and what you believe, you know when you go in like that risk, like what if, what if she doesn't do it? What if she fails? What if, you know, and then so to see her go from, you know, that 
program, I think they were 1639 yeah. the, the year before she took over. And then I think she took over the first of the COVID year 2020 and they were like 11 and 10 and they were 25 and 19. And then last year they finally put it together and figured out how to win this program and to win the, to win the Ohio Valley tournament. And you've got, you know, coach market SEMO does a great job in there. You got, you got some really good coaches at those, at those programs. So that was just a, that was a huge for me as a dad to get to see her do that. Um, it was a big, big moment in my in my life, you know. When you so watch her, when you watched her team play in that scenario or in any scenario during the season, when you watch her team play, are you are you more nervous than when you're coaching? Are you more stressed out? And when you watch it, are you watching it as a as a father, or are you, or is there still a coach in you that you're watching it as a coach? Yeah, I think I'm always a father, but I but I. You know, you can't get softball out of your mind. Like, but I was like last year when I watched them play, you could tell like she really had a great connection with her pitchers. You know, the first year or two, like, you know, man, she got, she, she connected with her pitchers as much as she needs to be or has to be. Last year, there was no doubt. Like, she really, really, the pitching staff, you could tell like they were all on the same page. Uh, extremely, extremely good effort out of Olivia Price all year. And, and, you know, to see her get – Olivia got uh, Conference Female Athlete of the Year and Pitcher of the Year, and you don't get those kind of awards unless you're locked in and you're on point. So very, very lucky for Tara to have a very talented pitcher to work with. And then obviously I uh, think that Olivia would say she was very lucky to have a talented coach to work with, a young coach. And so that from that standpoint, uh, that was what I, I – I watched the game. And I just – for me, it's all – the only reason I care is because I'm her dad. But then at the same time, you know, I can tell like, hey, they need a little more speed or they need, you know, they need this, they need that. Um, you can't help but evaluate from the softball side to some degree. It just, you can't turn it off, right? It just registers there. Uh, do you give her feedback? Do you wait till she asks you for feedback? What What is that dynamic like? Because, you know, sometimes coaches want to, you know, hey, let me just figure it out on my own. So there's that balancing act where she's got to figure some stuff on her own, but at the same time, you know, you might want to give her feedback or she might want feedback. How does that work? Yeah, you know, we don't talk. We really don't talk a whole lot. When we talk, it's usually about the grandsons and okay. you know, their sports and what they're doing. I'm more, you know, I'm, I am I know she can take care of the softball part and coach. So when I call her, I'm going to know about, you know, how Peyton's swing is, how's Aiden's knee is, is he playing football, how high is Maddox high jumping, you know, what's, what's going on with those three boys. That's what our – conversations are always are but then every once in a while she may ask me something or she may you know, about a week ago maybe a week and a half ago now uh, she did she texts me dad i need your advice on something give me a call and so there are moments when we'll rely and likewise i'll i'll call her want to know especially on some of the new recruiting stuff she's uh, ahead of me on and then technology she's always ahead of me on technology so i'll I'll ask for her help on on some stuff too, but very I would say like five percent, ten percent of our conversation is actually about college softball. Very limited, uh, more about the family. Wow, that's a it's a great story, and and I think you words were perfect. Divine intervention that day you just described. Thank you for sharing that story, that conference championship Saturday. That's one you're not going to forget. She won't forget. I'm sure. Both of you playing in the regionals. I'm sure you kept track of how they were doing at Evanston. And they were keeping track. As I, I told you when I had her on, I had her on the show in the interview. She said that her team was actually more fired up and upset when you guys didn't get to host. You were, you know, on the graphic. You were at LSU uh, than even when they were sent to Evanston, <laughs> which speaks volumes how much it's. It's just an awesome story, and I'm so happy for all of you. Uh, to go through that experience, that positive experience, which is a great story. And I agree with you. I think it was divine intervention. She mentioned the story. Harry ba Harry Blaylock, who she played for, was in charge of uh, over there in Evanston Regional uh, as one of the supervisors. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, how is you, you can't make this up. Yeah, Kerry, uh, we go back a long way. Kerry, of course, Tara played at yeah. Southern Oregon with Kerry Blaylock. And then when I started the Southern Force, Kerry Blaylock was uh, just – just taken over um, at Southern Illinois University. And she was uh, just a very, I don't know, very, very encouraging to me starting the Southern Force Gold program and always supportive. And, you know, as we grew and our team had success pretty quickly, 
a lot of the top players went on to the SEC or Big Ten. Kerry was, you know, and Kerry probably deserved those players because of letting us use their field for games and all the things she did. She did and then she's just a, a really fantastic person. She's a Southern Illinoisan uh, through and through, uh, good-hearted, hardworking. Her, her uh, parents grew up about – eight miles from where Tara and Aaron played high school ball and Jerry and played grade school ball in a little town called Heron, Illinois. And they were just a uh, typical Southern Illinois coal mine town family and uh, great people. So we're, we have a lot of fondness for Carrie and uh, being our family. No question. Uh, last thing is you could, obviously wrapping up the fall before you know, the season will get going in February. What's a couple of keys for this team uh, to continue that momentum from last year and go further, which I know is one of the goals on your team. What's going to be a couple keys for this team? Uh, I think the fielding percentage and double plays. I want to see increase in double plays and, and an increase in fielding percentage. We've been in that 963, 962, and 966 the last three years. And we double plays, we went 15, 14, 13 the last three years from 15 down to 14, 14 down to 13. I want to see that increase. I want over 20 double plays this year. I want to see our fielding percentage over 970. Um, to me, those are the keys. Like that's the offensive side. I, I know we're going to be, you know, good. I, I don't know what our numbers will be compared to the year past because the schedule is, is different, but I expect us to be a very good offensive team. And I think that even when we play, you know, the, the big programs on our schedule, will score enough runs to win some of the games. And, you know, last year we lost seven to six to Arkansas, seven to six to Michigan, uh, four to three to UCLA. You know, if we score three or more runs this year, I want to be able to think that we can win some of those games. Um, and and that's what I'm looking for, especially in that early season, to be, have, a, have a better defensive ball club uh, and then hopefully be able with the – by playing our best defensive ball club, still be able to put up enough runs to win those games, some of those games. Well, that is uh, Louisiana head coach Jerry Glasgow joining us here and in the circle. Uh, coach, thanks for uh, always talking to us. I always enjoy this every year. We do this annually uh, to talk softball and life. Uh, thanks for doing this. Good luck this upcoming season. I'm sure we'll, we'll definitely be talking during the year, but uh, always thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, thank you and appreciate the uh, support. You know, it's a uh, softball's grown so much because of reporters like you all that have these podcasts and there's just so much more information out there about our sport. So as a coach, it's a privilege to be able to help provide that. Thank you.